It has been called the Queen Mother of the Great Blackwater Swamps, one of the largest, most ecologically diverse wetland ecosystems on the planet. The Great Ogifinoki. Over millions of years, sediment from rising and falling sea levels walled off 700 square miles from the Atlantic Ocean. The giant basin began filling with fresh water. Oaks and grassland slowly gave way to bogs and swamp forests. The Choctaw Indians would come to call it Land of the Trembling Earth. Just a few feet below the mirror-like surface, the sandy bottom is covered with peat, a thick layer of partially decayed plants and leaves. This rotting vegetation brews the swamp water into an acid-rich black tea, the lifeblood of the Okefenokee. More than a thousand species of plants and animals thrive here, but there is no question who sits atop the food chain. The alligator we see today is truly an ancient creature. It's been around at least a million and a half years, perhaps as much as five million years. In fact, the American alligator represents the end of a very long evolutionary history, dating back from the dawn of the dinosaurs. Alligators and dinosaurs both shared common ancestors uh, more than 220 million years ago. It's not accurate to call alligators simple or primitive. They're actually highly sophisticated, very complex animals and superbly adapted for their life as top level or apex predators in the wetland ecosystems like the Okefenokee Swamp. Alligators have a well-developed cerebral cortex, the part of the brain that's associated with higher cognitive skills, unlike most other reptiles. And they're actually very capable of learning. They learn patterns in the environment very well. They have uh, excellent eyesight. They see about as well as we do. And their hearing is quite good as well. Scattered densely all over the face of an alligator are little organs called integumentary sense organs that are little nerve cells that are highly sensitive to touch or vibration. And even in the complete absence of light or sound, alligators are able to perceive a single drop of water on the surface of the water and orient to that. The alligator's skeleton reveals its secrets to being one of the last great free-roaming predators. Unlike many modern reptiles, their skulls are solid, flexing very little. The jagged teeth in front are for holding prey. The conical teeth in back are for crushing. Like their ancient cousin, the T-Rex, Gator skulls have large cavities to accommodate massive jaw muscles and to deliver bites measured at 3,000 pounds. Its brain is the size of your little finger, tucked up inside a thick core of bone. Early swamp settlers found the alligator notoriously difficult to kill. Anything less than a perfect shot to the center of the head is just a flesh wound. Very few animals have a larger increase in body mass from birth 
to maturity. An adult male can reach 16 feet and 1,200 pounds. Unlike humans, alligators have ribs in their neck, and these serve as anchor points for large muscles. This allows alligators during an attack to use the entire mass of their body to exert force on their prey. So in death rolls, they're able to really throw an animal off its feet. The gator's secret to incredible stealth lies deep inside its flexible rib cage. Alligators can fine tune their depth in the water by shifting the position of their internal organs. Even a thousand pound gator can slip away silently, leaving hardly a ripple. The alligator's role in the swamp is as simple as it is crucial. Keep the other predators in check and in order by eating them. It's a complex ecosystem with far more at play than gators silently cruising the ebony water. It's a landscape that changes dramatically from one region of the swamp to the next. Great fields of water lily carpet miles of open prairie. Their broad leaves grow to the size of dinner plates, carrying out the task of photosynthesis, sending air down hollow stalks to the roots. Native Americans dried the lily stalks and pounded them into flour. Other parts of the plant were used for herbal medicines. The decaying plant matter on the bottom creates methane gas, pushing chunks of peat up to the surface of the swamp. A myriad of plants immediately stake their claim on these floating islands. Among them, one of the strangest carnivores in the world, the delicate sundew. Each tentacle is covered with tiny hairs that secrete a sticky sweet syrup, living flypaper. When the insect touches a tentacle, it curls around the victim, hopelessly ensnaring it. The prisoner is slowly dissolved, turned into a nutrient-rich soup, and absorbed. The sundew is also a mini medicine chest used in hundreds of herbal and modern medicines to treat toothaches, coughs, and sunburn. As the peat islands fill up with grasses, the tiny sundew is choked out. A different family of meat eaters soon take its place. While their neighbors struggle to pull nutrition from the peat and acidic water, pitcher plants order takeout, the kind that delivers itself. Pitcher plants they emit a sweet nectar-like smell, or a foul decaying odor, luring insects into their tubes. Slippery sides and downward angled hairs force the victims down into a bowl of bacteria and digestive juices. Like everything else in the swamp, pitchers have their own enemies.
this ravaged parrot pitcher's last meal was a small army of ants. Whoever isn't tricked into perching on a sundew or diving head first into a pitcher plant must keep its eyes on the sky. No insect is safe when dragonflies are about, and they are nearly everywhere in the swamp. Dragonflies are among the most ancient creatures on Earth, far older than gators or dinosaurs. These voracious hunters are a marvel of aeronautical engineering that can fly forward, backwards, or stop on a dime and hover. Their eyes have 30,000 facets each, giving the dragonfly nearly 360 degree vision. Some cruise around endlessly looking for a meal or patrolling their territory. Others sit motionless, ready for just the right moment to pounce. Even the swift, biting yellow fly is no match for an eastern pond hawk. The Okefenokee is a quilt work of prairies and lakes connected by channels flowing through the swamp forest. Impenetrable thickets known as hells stretch for miles. It is a fearsome landscape to bushwhack across. The dense brush is a tangled riot of tree, shrub, and thorny vine competing for every inch of ground. Swamp lore is rich with haunting stories of adventurous or unlucky souls who lost their bearing and wandered for days or weeks in this no man's land. The shrub forest is on a relentless march to choke out the prairies and fill the swamp. The only thing holding it at bay is fire. The round lakes and open prairies of the Okefenokee are formed by a 20 to 30 year cycle of severe drought that gives rise to a cataclysmic wildfire. When the water is so low that even the peat is exposed and dry, roaring infernos burn down into the peat bed. Nothing is more destructive and essential to the health of this ecosystem. April 2007. The southeastern United States suffers from one of the worst droughts on record. High winds knock down a power line, igniting a small brush fire at the edge of the Okefenokee. The parched forest is a tinderbox. The flames are unstoppable, raging for weeks. Just as fire response teams are getting it under control, a bolt of lightning ignites a second fire deep in the swamp. The two blazes merge. The inferno burns for a month, 
consuming nearly a thousand square miles of swamp and forest. The swamp isn't devastated, it is rejuvenated. The longleaf pine is superbly adapted to withstand flames. Over millions of years, it has evolved a thick, fire-resistant bark and holds its limbs up high, far away from brush fires. This ancient pine doesn't just withstand a good scorching, it regularly sheds its incredibly long needles, scattering the forest floor with fuel. In fact, the long leaf counts on regular fires to kill off competitors and clear the way for its grass-like seedlings. These two are designed to survive flames. At one time, vast forests of virgin longleaf pine dominated the southeastern United States. Loggers clear-cut the pines in the 19th century for building materials. These majestic stands in the Okefenokee are among the 3% that remain. And they greet today's visitors to the great Blackwater Swamp. Chip Campbell has been guiding tours in the Okefenokee for more than a decade. His experience as a naturalist and search and rescue volunteer has taken him to nearly every corner of the swamp. Okefenokee Swamp is the queen mother of the great black water swamps the largest, most ecologically intact, one of the most biologically diverse wetland ecosystems of its type in the world. It's the largest of its type in North America. First and foremost, it's one of the largest tracts of really wilderness land, wild land, that we've got outside the southern Appalachians in the eastern United States. It, it's a huge place. You can see it from satellite photographs. This canal is a century-old reminder of the days when humans tried to tame the Okefenokee. In 1891, investors bought the swamp from the state of Georgia with dreams of draining it, getting rich from logging and fertile cropland. They enlisted steam shovels convict labor, and even gold miners to cut 11 miles deep into the heart of the swamp. But the brutally hard conditions and falling lumber prices conspired to kill the dream for a while. Uh, we do most of our traveling in the swamp on its boat trails. The old relic canals from human uh, activity in the past and the natural river channels, creek channels uh, of the Suwannee River headwaters. More than 350,000 ecotourists venture into the swamp every year to canoe, fish, camp, and hike. Out here, the sounds of civilization give way to the Oki Pinoki Choir.
for nearly 7,000 years. This has been the anthem of Alligator Kingdom. Alligators have a certain, you know, charm to them. They're charismatic megafauna, they're called. They're big, powerful, imposing animals. That they're remarkably graceful. That strikes people sometimes. They don't expect that. You see them, they move very slowly, very methodically, but there's a certain elegance to the way that they're, they can move through the water and then they can just explode from those positions into just full movement. You have to see how fast one can move in order to really fully appreciate the power that's there in those animals. We've got a lot of alligators in Oki and Oki Swamp. Now, the experts don't agree on exactly how many are in there, but it's in the many thousands. Some say eight to 10,000, some say 20 to 25,000. There are days, it seems like everywhere you look, you see something alive and moving. stop and look at just what's going on on the chunks of peat, the batteries, the insects. The, the we've, we've got grasshoppers that dive down under the water here. We have fishing spiders. Now we've got a number of different kind of creatures that you'll see down on a, a lower level. Well, if you just open your eyes and look, The Okefenokee's Feast for the Senses is draped in the silent, swaying mystery of the Deep South. Spanish Moss. Found only in humid, coastal plain environments, it's not a true moss, but an epiphyte a plant growing on another plant. But Spanish moss isn't a parasite. It's a filter feeder, straining all of its airborne nourishment out of dust and rain. It embodies self-sufficiency and the spirit of the native people who roamed the Okefenokee for thousands of years. The last of the creeks and Seminoles were driven out in the 1830s. The white pioneers soon came in through the piney forests, hacking out a trail through the shrub in search of a plot to call their own. They laid claims on the swamp's fertile islands and made homesteads. Forging out into the swamp as a fishing and trapping ground, they hunted gators, raccoons, and otters for pelts as trade goods. The vast pine forests were tapped to make turpentine. Ingenuity and subsistence were the order of the day. By 1909, the lumber companies came calling again. 
more than 80% of the great virgin cypress were hauled out of the swamp before the timber market went bust in 1927. Just a few old growth stands remain deep in the swamp. The Okefenokee Swamp of today, while it's had the hand of humanity on it, is still pretty much the same place it was when Europeans started walking the North American continent. One of the beauties of Okefenokee is that it is a testament to the, the restorative powers of nature, the, the ability of nature to reclaim a landscape uh, after, after we have exploited it. What is the value to us you know, as a culture, as a civilization, uh, as, a, as a global human society to really have these places where the fundamental ecological integrity and even to a larger extent, the fundamental wildness of the place remains. Uh, you get out into the heart of the swamp and you know, you're in a landscape that really is not a human landscape. Uh, it, it's, it's a landscape that speaks to you know, life across the ages. Uh, it's a landscape that, that you can see from a satellite photograph, you know, the expansiveness of it all. You know, Okefenokee is a fundamentally wild place. You know, it is a true wilderness.